All right, friends, good morning. Welcome back to the 2023 BART Conference. Wow, this has been wonderful. And I think we're about at the halfway mark. So, you know, keep going. It's, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And it's been so um, powerful what's been going on. I've been joining you online. My name is Shannon Smythe. I'm the newly appointed director of field education and vocational placement here at my alma mater, Princeton Theological Seminary. And I am really excited for our session this morning. That's going to kick off uh, another brilliant day of papers and dialogue and discussion and responses. So this morning, our first speaker, we're so thrilled to have her. She's been here participating already. And now we get to hear from her. This is Dr. Natalia Maranduk, who is most recently coming to us as a professor at the United Lutheran Seminary, not too far from our campus, and doing a really important constructive work in theology, doing historical theology, and ways that that intersects with a lot of really um, important work from um, feminist, gender, race, and queer theology, post-colonial migration studies, liberation, hermeneutics, and psychology. Uh, we are grateful to have you here today. We're looking forward to your paper, the title of which is Against Dominant, Bartian Christology and the Healing of the Christian Social Imagination. And the first respondent for you, Natalia, will be Dr. Roth Nishaka, who's joining us remotely. So whenever you're ready, we're grateful and here to listen. Good morning. A couple of summers ago, I had a conversation with a Jewish scholar, Amy Jill Levin. She said, all I wish is that my children would play in peace. With Christian children, we'd all be killed or fearing it. Now, the complicated history of weaponizing, social, uh, weaponizing socially Christian theological systems and imaginary, particularly soteriologies, accomplishes what all weapons do. It's, it's a business. The but what the hell is it about such systems that is pernicious? Where is the power hidden? The other ones I suggest um, of Christian systems, particularly in terms of deploying heteropatriarchy and white supremacy, share a common root as they intersect in the practice of dominance and the colonial power that sustains it, infecting much of the Christian imagination, as Willie Jennings aptly put it. In this paper, I will gesture toward a Barthian sourced Christology that attempts to resist domination, struggles against it, and suggests a measure of healing of the Christian social imagination. Engaging the work of Sarah Ahmed, a queer scholar who theorizes the notion of killjoy to destabilize racial, racialized heteronormative sociality, I suggest that Bart's Munus triplex Christological configuration can serve to envision Jesus as a killjoy in his roles as prophet who exposes the falsehood that grounds dominance as immigrant priest into the faraway country who negates creaturely negations, and as veiled drag queen who unveils God's love that empowers our neighbor loves. A prima facie reading of Bart's basic form of humanity, paragraph here of dialogical in 45, a portrait might well be among the most beautiful descriptions of mutuality and reciprocity in the I Dao dyadic building blocks of a social imaginary thus construed. 
deploying, however, a partial, a partial analogy between Christ's orientation toward humanity in being for us and our orientation on, a, on, on the other hand toward our neighbors, so being with them, Bart takes a descriptive road meandering through various components, various component parts of rightly lived human sociality, which includes, as many of you know, mutual seeing, speaking, and assistance performed all with gladness. Now, this shared vulnerability, neediness, and fluid plasticity of I and thou in entangled coexistence and reciprocal subjectivity shaping suggests suggest a framework of deep solidarity that goes against the grain of colonial dominance. Human agency appears as a narratival becoming nurtured in organic spontaneity framed by an ethic of mutual care. However, there are lots of problems underneath this surface. For example, wouldn't I-thou relationality depict a binary di dyadic reductionism that would further lead to a, a sort of individualism that is blind to richer, fuller human socialities? Also, wouldn't this be blind, for all that seeing invoked by Bart, to the particularities of the people involved, such as gender, sexuality, racialized sexuality, um, and especially wouldn't it involve a kind of blindness to the patriarchal dominance that Bart himself declares normative in heterosexual binaries? In fact, it follows right after this section um, in Bart's Church Dogmatics, a rich description, rich in quotation marks perhaps, of how the heterosexual binary a relationality, man-woman relations, uh, these are actually the building blocks and the most evident form of the idol relationality that we can think of. Now, that critique aside, for Bart, this um, kind of sociality and the ethic attending it are grounded, of course, Christocentrically, in the sense of a partial mimesis between Christ's thorough orientation toward human creatures in the mode of a salvific unveiling of veiled divinity and our more limited call to be oriented toward our human neighbors. The correspondence between the Christic canotic orientation to others and human spontaneous generosity toward others is matched in this account by what I would um, positively read as a queer-like ineffability of this encounter. The unveiling of the incarnate word remains at the same time veiled. We cannot master and control it and neither ought we to imagine such mastery or control of others. Hence, the Barthian injunction for joy. Nothing less than, in his own words, the core secret of what it means to be human. Yet, Barth's emphatic insistence on the joy of human encounters is worth some interrogation. Sarah Ahmed, who theorizes and critiques the imperative to exhibit happiness and therefore contribute with such performance of joy toward a putative common good gets to the problem veiled, pun intended, in Bart's text, or at least it's prima facie reading. She affirms that happiness scripts are often gendered, sketched, it a heteronormative vision of whiteness. For the, deviant, uh, for the deviant troublemakers, trouble awaits. That goes hand 
in hand with a reversal logic, according to which gender scripts are in fact happiness scripts, insofar as they provide rules for what gendered people are to do to be happy. So the possibility of joy is entailed in performing this script. This logic, I contend, is equally at play in the racial colonial imaginary that intersects with the heteropatriarchy Ahmed illustrates. Ahmed shows that following this happiness script is what ensures a good dose of conviviality. And who doesn't want that? We get along with one another in peaceful encounters when we express happiness in normatively accepted ways, which becomes a duty in order for our interlocutors to remain in the happy circle. The problem, of course, is that such happiness, such a happiness circle is false. To state the obvious, in what sense can I, thou encounters, enjoy, uh, entail joy and gladness in a world suffused with the normalization of dominance? under the canopy of a colonially generated heterosexist racial Christian imaginary. It is no accident that Bart follow, follows his idol prose immediately in the next subsection with an unpardonable apologetics of heteropatriarchy. Other scholars, particularly I have in mind uh, Faye Bodley D'Angelo, have argued um, compellingly for, uh, for me, um, how Bart's position is uh, quite uh, on gender and um, uh, his uh, apologetic of heteropatriarchy that follows the I thou fragment, uh, how this is uh, utterly um, incongruent with uh, other large theological commitments that Bart has, um, particularly other Christological commitments. So um, back to Sarah Ahmed, the happiness imaginary then is the resultant of the sexist straight and white supremacist imaginary. The feminist, the queer, or the non-white troublemaker because she gets in the way of aimed happy because not being able to follow the goods that populate their imaginary. Judith Butler's recognition of the inevitability of gender trouble shows how the prevailing law threatens ones with trouble to keep one out of trouble. The happiness of others then could prevent your own trouble by threatening you with the unhappiness of getting in trouble. Happiness scripts as gendered and racialized scripts function as orienting as an orienting power toward heterosexuality, racism, and ultimately dominance. Ahmed shows and concludes that uh, quote happiness scripts could be thought of as straightening devices, ways of aligning bodies with what is already lined up. To deviate from the line is to be threatened with unhappiness, end quote. Happiness scripts take a powerful role as they portray a world whose stability depends on the subjects oriented the right way, which translates as the straight way or the white way. And to deviate from such an orientation is to take a risk with cascading effects. These effects correlate with the warped logic of reciprocity embedded in this model. This constru construal of happiness entails a mutuality of desires that masks, in fact, the ugliness of domination. The seeming innocence of claiming to be happy when others are happy um, is a problematic take on Jesus's neighbor uh, on Jesus's commandment to love your neighbor you want the neighbor's happiness of course which results in your own 
but it conceals a coercion. One person's happiness is dependent on another's happiness. Inversely, is dependent on us and all would threaten my own joy and has the power to determine it. So then the other has the duty to be happy for my own sake. The desire for the happiness of others participates in this script of dominance precisely because it is inscribed within the social imaginary that dictates gendered and racialized ascriptions as part of the sinister power play of white supremacy, going against life itself. In fact, heterosexual, uh, patriarchal white supremacy. And it is a necrophilic script of oppression. It kills. Children can't play with each other. To go against this script then is to be a killjoy, a killjoy. What is a killjoy? The killjoy recognizes and expresses in various forms the inequalities, injustices, and oppression existing in human encounters and within the social imaginary that frames them. Killjoy is prophetic. They show the violence that is necessary to cover up with alleged joy the truth of encounters stru structured on domination. The killjoy person performs the labor of revolutionary struggle against the surface of happiness under which life is crushed to make room for the possibility of actually living. Ahmed's discussion of happiness and the political power of the killjoy as the one who comes between bodies who expect to be in agreement Offers, of, uh, offers a reframing of human encounters, generative, I contend, for a Barthian Christological resistance to dominance. I suggest here that Barth's Christology might supply a measure of, of healing or a, a measure of a healing vision for the Christian social imagination and the West in the logic and the creaturely is little to creatures. The resulting dominance neg negates life. Bart's Christology operates as a negation of this negation. Uh, there is nothing uh, radical about this. We learn parts this way in many introductory classes. Um, now, by containing the asymmetries of in the construal of the God non God relations, Bart renders their leakage in the world and within human socialities sinful. So he notes a problem, but he doesn't stick to his own script because he leaks the asymmetries into heteronormative patriarchy as he describes um, the dyadic I thou in terms of man, woman with the man superior, the woman inferior like in the mode of uh, the man leads, the woman follows. Um, and uh, this is, fundamental. This is one of the fundamental realities about uh, being human in the world. It comes in this, these sorts of pairs, men, women, and they are uh, hierarchically organized, these pairs, and there is no way out. And of course, there is no third. So um, Barth doesn't do in his own theology what he preaches in other parts of his theology. In his Count Jesus is for us as well as with us. But we humans can only be with each other. Attempting the Christic asymmetry of being for rather than only with humans, uh, our neighbors, is to enact oppressive domination, posing as the saviors. 
resistance in these asymmetries. Creatures cannot conduct their, exist their existence in full or even, asym in, even in asymptotic, asymptotic imitation of Jesus. Only the God human can exist for other humans as a non-extinguishable, canonic self-donation. Humans cannot be the burning bush. We drastically delude ourselves when we try, plus we burn the world. What else does the scorching power of colonizing hetero-white supremacy and domination achieve? We do burn the world. And we do delude ourselves when we do that, imagining that we do some good. Willie Jennings calls this potent illusion the modern Christianity's diseased social imagination. Its disease is complex, but the root of it is a negation, the disavowal of the centrality of Christ in the Christian social imaginary, or more precisely, um, in his terms, the negation of an intellectual and spiritual landscape shaped by the incarnation of God, who in Christ took on an earthly life of intimacy, belonging, and connection. Put differently, this is fundamentally a negation of grace and a negation of love. Interestingly, I would add, um, in Barth's construal of the I-Thou relationality, there is little speech about love. The Christians are woven with the expansion of colonial dominance, Jennings adds, that it has lost its organic incarnational character that allows for fluidity, morphability, and Christ-like becoming. Jennings argues that the Western intellectual claims became ossified and ordered, abstracted from embodied existence, yet demanding adaptation and change, according to a foreign logic from indigenous and colonized people, among whom it claimed ironically to be host and owner. In Barthian terms, it claimed to be for them rather than just with them in their own terms and alongside their own life narratives. What emerged is the horrific inequity and injustice of racial domination instead of the loving intimacy of joining mixing and being transformed by the myriad ways of life and beauty with which God, the ultimate lover of creaturely difference, surprises us. Jennings appeals to Bart both to shed light on the extraordinary hubris contained in the racial attribution that the colonial movement yielded and to sketch an alternative. Jennings notes, um, Jennings notes, um, that uh, the Barthian God unveils God's self in the incarnation, undetermined by human beings or anything else, and loves us faithfully, unconditionally, and radically in, in infinite divine freedom, devoid of any contingency or necessity. The freedom of God to become incarnate in Jesus and to love us is the source of our originated freedom, and creaturely interdependence. Yet, colonizers envision themselves perpetually as providential performers of a divine-like like act, unilaterally conditioning those whom they invade, instantiating a racialized trajectory of their becoming, organized around the invaders' white, sexually conforming bodies. Such performance of heteropatriarchal whiteness entails imagining absurdly being independent of the connectedness of all creatures, forcing others into patterns of dependence on each other. In Ahmed's Creek, this is for frustrated organically queer bodies and force fitting them in the Protestant bed, finding their bodies and forcing them for Christian heteronormativity. In Bart's actualistic terms, 
the healing of such a diseased Christian social imagination, patriarch domination, needs to be nurtured by Christ himself. To what extent then could Bart provide, provide resources for a measure of healing? How could Bart's Munus triplex Christological configuration with Christ performing prophetic, priestly, and royal roles offer a robust enough option? In order to test this possibility, I will put Bart in conversation with Marcella althaus reed and Soren Kierkegaard to envision Jesus as prophet, priest, and drag queen, entangled in a contagious love story. In the spirit of both althaus reed and Kierkegaard, my remarks are not definitive, system-solid answers, bingo-like arrivals. What follows is more an invitation, a possible pathway, a becoming together in the struggle and the strive where we live and move and have our being and becoming. Some of this will take uh, the form of questions rather than answers. So first, might we imagine Jesus to be the radical, the false happiness in unchallenged I thou socialities, diseased by heteronormative white supremacy? While Bart's basic form of humanity is configured in this binary, which is further hierarchically conditioned when the binary turns out to be the dyadic, the dyadic heterosexual norm idealized in the embodiment of hetero marriage, notwithstanding Bart's own triadic two wives household. Bart's other basic Im imagery is the covenant relationship of God with God's people who are not conceived in the re register of dyadic socialities within the covenant. Perhaps this ambivalence, if not inconsistency, at least um, multiple possibilities in Bart's theological anthropology might open a possibility of interrogated the putative truth of I thou. Is there a way of conceiving of a prophetic role of Christ uh, that empowers us to be truth speakers in a way that speaks against the dominating law logic that in fact Christian social imaginary and the attending practices. Nala Althaus Reed speaks of truth as active. Marcel Reed as the only truth. Only hypocritical people may claim to live according to the rules contra natura of heterosexual politics and theology. End quote. We are all queer, she contends, because we, quote, live and love according to reality, end quote, rather, th rather than a binary grid of control that wants to chain us to itself. Passion is a human reality that eventually breaks free from the closet. Quote again, in the several volumes of Barthian theology, um, Althaus Reed writes, which Mary Dale sees as destructive female, uh, destructive to female beings, there is lust that needs to be frantically controlled by gendering, by family structures, and so forth. Meanwhile, Bart's lustful passion for his love was present during his writing. The theologian is never detached from life's experience. Uh, um, I uh, transcode, I uh, did slightly, very slightly. <laughs> Performing prophet prophetic passion through queer sexuality is not only liberating um, for queer people themselves, but also a perf performance of truth in myriads of instantiations and encounters open to newness, surprise, and uniqueness 
that speaks outwardly. It has a prophetic character. For Kierkegaard, truth, passion, and uniqueness also relate indelibly. Truth is objectivity, and uh, truth is subjectivity, and subjectivity is truth. In the postscript, Kierkegaard says that an objective uncertainty, uncertainty, a certain uncertainty, held fast in an appropriation process of the most passionate inwardness is the truth, the highest truth attainable for an existing individual. But subjectivity for Kierkegaard is not a thing, a static entity, but always a relational becoming. In fact, multiple relations that generate reciprocal building up of each other as neighbor lovers who participate in the larger stream of God's love and co-participate in each other's subjectivity. There is no sustainable I thou, there are no sustainable I thou dyadic relations without a divine middle term between people. God is present as spirit, is the spirit of Christ between human beings. The middle term in human relations, God prevents each person from becoming vulnerable to the annihilation by the other, either by suffocating in the other's colonizing prison or by giving of oneself with such infinite surrender that there is nothing left of one's own self except to serve the other. Kierkegaard warns against such servitude, which undergirds colonial, dominan colonial dominance more broadly. Quote from Kierkegaard, every person is God's bond servant. Therefore, she does not belong to anyone, end quote. Without this divine middle term, the interhuman space would implode and the people involved would collapse into one another, resulting in human power differentials asserting themselves and uh, one colonizing the other. God the Spirit as middle term assures a proper interstition between persons while also preventing the disintegration of the attachment of the relation. The spirit's presence in between obviates both a centrip centripetal crushing of the relationship and a centrifugal splintering of the relation between human beings. The space of human relations and love is good, therefore, only insofar as it is humanly as well as divinely populated with the ultimate and proximate context rightly aligned. Secondly, could we think of Jesus as the divine immigrant priest who comes into the land of creatureliness as the sun going into the faraway country and entangles himself in the concreteness of creatures' lives to negate the negation that made its way in the creaturely land as a little and absurd import? I'm going to borrow again from Kierkegaard and Althaus Reed to address this. According to Kierkegaard, Christ entangles himself via the spirit in the world as a lover of human persons. The flow of God's stream of love is both radical and unidirectional, like an, like an immigrant priest from God to us. In works of love, Kierkegaard depicts a lake whose waters are replenished by a hidden secret spring at the bottom of the lake and the stream that carries the waters forward. As the spring keeps supplying new water and the stream moves it forward, this lake's waters are always in motion. God, but it's not just it's not just a movement, always in motion. It's always moving toward creation and specific toward the particularities of different elements of creation. Now, Kierkegaard is quite anthropocentric, which is unexcusable, but he's referring to God's love going to the particularity, the unlikeness of each human person, the, the di di differentiality of each human person in, in relation to the other. We are unique creatures. He won't use the term intersection, but he does speak of particularity, uniqueness, dissimilarity. 
So God's love goes to the particularity of each human person. Um, now, now, God attracts us to love God's self, and when we do, we enter God's own stream of love that is already directed to um, fellow human beings. God is structurally part of human relating, human loving, and we are in participation in God's own love for us. God's loving power empowers earthly lives, earthly relations to participate in God's vision and in God's love, which is a love of justice. And so it infuses us, or uh, to speak in more Barthian terms, uh, while God remains uh, uh, outside ourselves, it allows to our participation in what God does in us, uh, for us to have a kind of an import um, of divine power, which the priest brings to us to resist with more powers than we would have as creatures alone to resist systems and hegemonies that dominate certain crush our loving forms of relations it's organic now um marcella alphouse read um shows us that to think of God as God is queer. And this involves a theological praxis, praxis that resists fixed um, sexual and other categories. Human ways of being and knowing are always embodied sexual ways of knowing. And we ought not to assume that we know what we will find in the path of knowing others and ourselves as a lived praxis. God is present in and through radically different bodies and their loves. But these, like with Kierkegaard, are not static categories, let alone binaries. We ought to resist imposing um, identity scripts on others and regulate how people narrate their lives and stories. Such scripts, particularly heteronormative ones, artificially and painfully restrict how people interpret who they are and how they are moving and relating to others in the world. The provision of such normative sexual scripts does the further damage of dividing people in categories such as good or acceptable um, subjects and bad or deviant ones, often with tragic consequences. Threading with openness and welcoming um, the complexity of uh, human lives in myriad forms of sexual expression and forms of love is both liberative and healing and um, at the same time, uh, prophetically speaking, into a reality into which we are invited. In Althaus Reed's construal, the theological scandal is that bodies indeed speak and God speaks through them. Queerness is something that belongs to God, and people are divinely queer by grace. Queerness originally belongs to God, and I would argue is theologically synonymous with God's love. God's grace queers us, and our bodies speak it, while that speech is also God's, who liberates us from neat and tidy categories in which the heteronormative forces of domination place us. God's own love is radically queer precisely in this radical magnitude, among other features. Um, so then, if God's reign is in Bart's um, um, understanding, then uh, typified in Christ, can we imagine Christ as a divine drag queen? robed in human embodiment. And that kind of embodiment brings with it God's radical love for us and among us. God in Christ then could be seen as the very manifestation of a love that is so extreme that it dissolves existing boundaries from the divine between, uh, from the divide between the divine and the human down to societal 
um, boundaries and binary categories that shackle people. This can be seen then perhaps as a radical intimacy that doesn't restrict itself within artificially construed uh, enforced boundaries. Neither does it obliterate differences, nor does it assimilate them into a singular cent center of dominating power. It unites genuinely diverse pe people in interdependence and interdependent freedom in, in surprise through desires for intimacy and belonging. So might, truly, might we truly imagine then Jesus as a drag queen who comes veiled in drag flesh to unveil the radically loving God who empowers us to be for others in their drag or otherwise bodies. Marcella Althaus Reed describes a popular image in Buenos Aires, uh, the Santa Librada, Saint Liberated, that depicts a young woman who looks like the Virgin Mary, yet she is crucified and her body hangs from the cross reminding us of Jesus. People as both Virgin Mary and Jesus. Her prayers and rituals associated with her, as is the case with both males, as with her, neighbors think of her as the woman Christ for the poor. Others see her as crucified Mary, the Christa statue that was displayed in the prominent Episcopal Cathedral in Manhattan and was taken off very soon thereafter. Uh, it was too disturbing. Um, who was, uh, this Christa statue was a clear image of a female Christ. But Santa Librada is not. She's ambiguous, not unlike the veiled bodies of drag queens, perhaps not unlike the veiled divinity of Christ. This ambiguity fills a gap created by the religious colonizers uh, in the case of um, Santa Librada, who, um, so a colonizer who, the colonizers who approached the colonized through Mary more than Christ in South America. Librada then sits at the interstice between God and people, making the otherwise inaccessible God present. present. Librada mediates, veils, and unveils Christ. For Kierkegaard too, and Bart uh, perhaps borrows from Kierkegaard here. God is always mediated, veiled and unveiled because God is always the lover who gives. What, while Christ's greatest commandment includes the call to love God, God is not a divine magnet that gets our loves to stick to it in a fixed manner. Perhaps we can think of God as queer liveliness, loving liveliness, always giving, always loving, always creating, healing, and liberating, a queer God. God resends our love to God's own beloveds because God doesn't keep our love for God's self. God is not a creature of need as we are as Kant would put it. Um, so God resends our love for God further to God's own beloveds, God's radically diverse people, like a letter with a forwarding address. This is a take on Kierkegaard. Our love for God redestination other people via God. God's bountiful love transforms and, I propose, queers our labels against the logic and the practice of domination. Kierkegaard speaks of um, an, um, a, a sort of a leap of grace, he complexifies that, but I think that image is helpful to imagine that we perhaps can leap into the divine love uh, into the divine love flow as we would leap into a river that is always in motion and is carrying us with it toward its destination, other people. 
whom God already loves in their specific human difference, intersectional identity, and particular, particularly place of suffering. As um, in our difference, we are not simply different. There are always hierarchies, there are always sub, uh, subjugation, and that is the sort of reality against which we are empowered to, um, to, to, to struggle and to, and to resist. So then relating to other people, loving other people, sexually or otherwise, then translates into participating in God's love flow for others and in God's queering grace, as Marcella Althaus Reed would, would put it, uh, grace that nurtures us um, in our own narrative uh, as it is, um, 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 uh, in, uh, nurtures us in our narrative and empowers us to speak the truth of our, our own narrative. Um, borrowing one but then um, as middle term is inside the relational arc formed in human creatures. Um, so on one hand, we need to deserve God's love. In another sense, participates in so God's mission uh, between and among human neighbors. Human relations then structurally um, include God as a third presence. This third middle presence cuts through false binaries in human identities and relations. It cuts against uh, socialities that are rooted in domination. And perhaps it empowers us to resist them. Thank you. Natalia, thank you so much. We're going to give the uh, first response to uh, Rothney, who is joining us from South Africa. <clears throat> Very much. Uh, and, and let me just start by once again appreciating this paper for its richness and also for its boldness. Uh, I think the, the issues that you have raised in this paper are indeed the very issues that prevent us from being uh, these, the, the most idealized uh, a human and citizens of, of this world. So let me just start by, by, by noting what it is that I heard Natalia say as, as she spoke to us uh, in this paper. <clears throat> First, I, I, I thought her saying very clearly that uh, we are here confronted with a particular template, uh, that of, of Bart's Christology, uh, that seemed to be such a powerful and dominant template, making it sometimes almost impossible uh, to deal or to bring about the necessary healing for this social imagination that we all crave for. Uh, noting also that, <clears throat> that it becomes difficult to accommodate the lived experiences of, of some of these communities that you have mentioned, the queer and so on and so forth, as a result of the coloniality that has happened, giving therefore that dominance uh, to that position. Uh, you also uh, uh, do a lot of comparing uh, some other voices against this dominant voice. You've made uh, quite a lot of, of, of reference to the heteronomity that makes it very impossible to, to imagine other forms of love and relationships of people of the world. <clears throat> and, and, and while I was listening to you, Natalia, I could not yeah. but think of uh, of uh, Audrey Lord's, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And, and as a result of that, we, we are confronted or we're staring in the face of this frustration. We, we know uh, what should be done and what must be done for our, us to be better neighbors, uh, better human beings, and more loving human beings. But as a result of the templates that are used and that have been used uh, for the longest time, it seems impossible for us to maneuver. And so that's why I, I uh, my point and, and what, that's why my thoughts come to Audrey Lord, Lord uh, because we will have to do something uh, uh, radically to, to deal with the templates, at least that it allows us to bring from outside uh, things that can make us operate and coexist better as citizens of, of the world. I have not had uh, your paper beforehand, but I hope that some of the things that I could glean from your speech 
just now uh, are the things that I would like to take away from, from the conversation that we've just started on this very important subject. And thank you once again uh, for this. Thank you very much. That's a very kind response. Um, I appreciate particularly um, the way you speak of um, Audre Lorde's um, uh, thought that uh, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Well, so, uh, and the reason why we can't is because they are insufficient. Uh, now, sometimes they are the wrong tools, but many times, uh, and, and, and they could hurt us. Uh, so in my um, construal here, is, um, I look at uh, the possibility of seeing, uh, in a sense, a higher power, but it's not raw power. It's a kind of a loving flow that comes our way and gently enables us to be the kind of creatures uh, that would participate precisely in that way of life that Christ brought among us uh, in a way that doesn't imitate Christ in the sense that we are not um, doubling Christ's work. But nonetheless, there is a gentle power, a loving power that might um, open possibilities for a different kind of social uh, patterning, a different social matrix, a different kind of sociality. Um, and some of what I say here is uh, tentative and needs to be developed more, but uh, this is a route, um, a, a schematic route that envisions um, kind of a, a way of functioning as human beings um, in, um, in the power of the incarnation and understanding um, the incarnation uh, as uh, quite um, radically among us, as, as, as um, um, an immigrant who comes and is among people, and so it, there, there is there is a there is a difference, but there is a difference that's embraced, and there is a difference that heals and empowers and brings uh, a richer love. Mm -hmm.